And then I'm going to take us into Ephesians chapter 1 to see how some of those things played out. Amen? Amen. In the book of Ephesians, Paul uses the word in Christ or in God or in Him almost 40 times. So the book of Ephesians is a very important concept. The first three chapters, <laughs> Paul introduce, introduces us to deep positional truths and the realities of what Christ has done for us. Amen? So the title of my message today is simply In Him. And we're going to talk about the benefits of spiritual union and how man is saved from a positional standpoint. Now, the past several months I've been talking about experiential salvation and process salvation in our sanctification and the warnings and the commands that we have to, to the manward side of faith. And now I want to go back so that we're, we always have this. How many know we have to stay in balance, right? So now I want to go back and take you back to the positional side. We're going to be talking a lot about what God has done that we cannot do today. Amen? So apostolic doctrine, or what we would call now the New Testament, presents three time zones of salvation based on an apparent paradox that we see from this side of reality. And so the Bible and all Christian doctrine is affected by this crucial point in what Paul calls in <coughs> Philippians, in Ephesians, and in Colossians, spiritual understanding. And one of the problems that I have encountered over the years in the modern church is there's very little focus on these important aspects of spiritual understanding. And in Paul's prison epistles, it is one of his primary desires that the church would know. How many know that knowledge is power? Amen? Yeah. And God's word is there for us so that we may know. And you can never arrive at a fully functional faith and spiritual maturity until you are really deep down established in the, gen the uh, I would call the general understanding of these truths about these different realities that God moves in and the plan of salvation, you're going to see, I'm going to show you how it has flowed throughout the ages and in different time zones and different realities. And it's quite fascinating how complex and yet simple it all is. So we sit there and we know it's easy to be saved. You receive Christ by faith. But what God had to do to get us there is incredible. How he's put things together one thing at a time over the eons of time and things in heaven and things in earth are affected. And so we know we were studying, <clears throat> we've been studying the attributes of God on our Thursday night. And one of the things we understand is that one of God's attributes is he lives in the eternal now. So God's primary mode of existence is a different type of time zone than we live in. And since God is outside this time zone. He knows the end from the beginning, and he knows all things, which shows that he lives in a higher dimensional reality. And so this generally is referred to different ways in the Bible, like heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem, the kingdom of heaven, and there's all kinds of different ways that this is expressed. This is an acronym for the higher spiritual reality where the direct presence of God exists. Now we know that God is omnipresent in, in the natural realm, but his manifest presence is primarily resides in the heavenly realm where his throne is. So like we don't see Jesus right now, why? Because he is in the heavenly realm and as we are connected to his presence through these truths which I'm going to show you today. So God is outside the time as we know it in a higher dimensional plane or an eternal plane of existence and therefore eternal life is an acronym for us experiencing the God kind of life. So God has destined all of us right now, all believers are destined for eternal life. That means that you and I one day are going to exist on the same plane of existence that God does and we will be directly with him for all eternity and that's the good news of the gospel. Amen? Amen? That Jesus did all these amazing things, lived our life, died our death, resurrected, showed us, opened the door to the kingdom of God, and we're not, we're not even manifesting the fullness of the benefits yet. None of us have yet. We are only in 
the beginning stages of what we will actually be, and that's the hope of glory. Amen? And I always encourage people, and as I've gotten a little older, maybe not as old as a couple people here, I think you got a couple and maybe someone's about two or three years older than me. Anybody? <laughs> I've kind of started, you start, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I've started to, to shift my life over kind of counting down the time a little bit. So when I, when I came to 50, as I was arriving at that point, I'm like, okay, from a natural standpoint, if I live a full life, I got about three decades left on this earth. So it's really important how I spend the rest of my time. And I'm preparing myself now for eternity, and at the same time, it's my last and only opportunity to affect this world. Once the Lord takes me home, my work is over. And the same for everyone in this room. Amen? So this is our time to affect the now. Amen. Amen. But we can only perceive these things through the work of Christ, through the promised indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which illuminates this reality through the revelation of Scripture. That is why Pastor Eric is adamant about being Scripture centered. If, if you know preachers today, if you are not, if your the content of your ministry is not filled with the Word of God oozing and coming from the pulpit and thundering from the pulpit, you're basically a motivational speaker. Because Paul says to young Timothy, preach. The Word. Amen. Preach. He didn't say preach that just God loves you or just preach that God has these amazing things in store for you or God wants to bless you and give you good things. There's a whole gamut. There's a whole wideness to God's truths and the full counsel of His will, as the Bible says. And we need all of it. Amen? So God, how he God <clears throat> navigates these realities in his plan of salvation. And through his wisdom, he had to craft a plan of salvation, stay with me here, that took all these factors into consideration, right? So therefore, the way that God had to do it, which had begun in eternity past, how many know that God's plan of salvation, the scripture says, begin in eternity past? Before man was even created, it says, from the foundation of the world, Christ was already going to come. Right? So God unfolded it in segments over our, what I call, what I call natural time, our, our time period that we live in, right? So salvation, therefore, and this is an interesting thing that I discovered through the studies of scriptures, is that salvation is not a one-time event. We often think, well, I came to the altar and I gave my heart to Jesus. And really that's yes and no. But the Bible also says that you have to continue and those who endure to the end will be saved. And I'm going to show you some of those things in a minute here, so hang with me. So, the plan of salvation began in the Garden of Eden at the curse. Right? The seed of the woman is the promised Messiah. And the culmination of salvation doesn't happen until the return of Christ at the glorification of the believer and the end time judgment. And so God unveiled these things, right, progressively through various dispensations of time. You had the pre-flood world, then you had Noah, the post-flood world, you had the coming of Abraham, the beginning of the Hebrew nation, then you had the time of the judges and the prophets moved into the law period of Moses, now we're in a dispensation called the New Covenant, or the Gospel of Jesus Christ, or the Church Age, right? This is a time of grace that is a limited opportunity to draw all men to Christ. But how many know this isn't the last dispensation? Nope. Right? There are several more to come. There's going to be something called the Great Tribulation. There is something called the Thousand-Year Reign of Christ. There is something called... The, when Satan comes out of his dungeon after a thousand years, there's going to be a worldwide apostasy one last time, and there's going to be Armageddon, and then there's going to be a final judgment. How many know that? And we don't get until all the good stuff until the eternal age, which is last. Amen? It's good. We have to know those things. So in reality, from a 
God's salvation time scale, we're probably about three quarters of the way through. Amen? And we still don't know what that means as far as the natural time. Jesus could be not coming for another 2,000 years yet, but as far as the amount of dispensations that, that God moved in, we know we're about three quarters of the way through. So the first hurdle that God had to tackle was to craft a plan that would connect the higher spiritual realm to the natural existence, right, which we are now fallen, and that is why Jesus had to be incarnated. Everybody, amen? amen? Because God, we knew through the law that man can't save himself, and that God was going to have to do it for us. And so God would bridge this gap himself by creating a hybrid version of man, which is called the last Adam in Scripture, which was a new platform for the re-imaging of mankind in the image of this new type of man, which was Jesus Christ. How many know that when, we, uh, when you and I are glorified, we are going to be glorified in the exact same way Jesus was? There's going to be nothing different. You're going to come out of the grave, you're going to resurrect, out, however, whether you're, you're dust again or you're still bones, it don't matter. You're going to, right? You're going to come out of the grave fully formed, breathing a new human being, but you're going to be glorified, amen, when he takes you up into heaven. <clears throat> We're going to talk more about that in a minute. And so, in the same time, now hear me out here, in this plan of salvation, on top of those things, right, God had to preserve our unique individuality, amen, this is not Buddhism, where everybody is just a drop in the sea, God had to preserve, like, Mary is going to be Mary in heaven, Maria is going to be Maria in heaven, right, Sammy is going to be Sammy in heaven, just the glorified version. You don't lose your memories, your personality, or your individuality. You're always who you are now is who you're going to be in heaven apart from the final removal of the sin nature. God also had to do this in a way to not violate our right of choice. And that's a big debate in Christian circles, but I think it's very clear that is what's called faith. And that is why the new covenant is a faith-centered covenant. It is not a works. And you have to choose to believe in Jesus Christ. Amen? Whomsoever believes. Right? And so, he would do this by rearranging the Godhead in heaven, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. Send his son as a human being, ransom mankind, Ransom us from the captive of Satan and become a platform of resurrection to recreate this new type of human being made re-imaged in the image of the Messiah. And so let me show you the Godhead here. In eternity past, on the left, the Trinity was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they are one God, three persons. Amen? We are not modalists here. We believe in the three distinct personalities. It's not one God, three manifestations. It's one God, three distinct persons. We saw that at the baptism of Jesus Christ. You had the voice of the Father. You saw They saw the Holy Spirit come down and Jesus come out of the water. He wasn't putting on a magic show there. right? You saw the three personalities at once. And so in the Godhead, God had, in, in salvation, God had to rearrange things, right? And so... In lieu of the salvation, the Trinity now, the Father begets the Son, right? The Scripture says. He is begotten of the Father, right? And the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the reason is, first of all, the requirements of the sin payment and the atonement had to be met so that mankind was cleansed and then the whole, that's why the Holy Spirit came after the work of Christ. Because the Holy Spirit cannot unify and be in spiritual union with sinful man. And so when, when, when the veil was torn, and I'm talking the flesh of Jesus Christ, the way was open for now man to be in fully connected with God. And the Holy Spirit then came at Pentecost. And since that moment, all believers are indwelt by the Holy Ghost. Amen? 
So this hypostatic union, as it's called, where Jesus is fully human and fully God, and he had to incarnate, right, in order to take on this nature. And so you have God the Father in the heavenly realms, and you have us humans down here. And what Jesus did is unite the divine nature with the human nature, right? So Jesus shared all the divine nature as the Father and the Spirit, and Jesus also shared the, the, the human nature as you and I. In other words, he has a body, he sleeps, he gets up, he lived, he ate, all those different things. Right? And so because of that, he joined the two, he is now the bridge where now we have a place to return back to God. It's called the, the, the consubstantial, fancy theological term, which means he bridged the gap between the two. Because ultimately, even though we're in the image of God, we are not divine. Amen? Can I get an amen? amen? That's New Age beliefs that has infiltrated the church in a lot of circles. It's, we are little gods theology. That's not the, the right um, interpretation of that scripture, what he was saying there. You are not divine. You cannot speak things into existence. Only God can do those types of things. Now, you can move on your faith, but, but God is the one who does it. But at the same moment, we are still in the image of God, and now we are connected to the divineness of God through Jesus. Everyone understand that? It's really important to get that right or your theology is going to go off to the right or to the left. Amen? So, knowing that, now because Christ became human, we, and, work, and His work on the cross, we are now fully connected to God again. There's nothing that stands between us anymore, which which sin brought, and the law, which I'm going to get to in a minute, later on, actually. So, man is a triune being. The scripture says, um, several places, I gave one example here, in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, and this could be an entire sermon in itself, but I just want to give you a basic platform to make my point. <clears throat> now may the God of peace himself sanctify you, what? Entirely. entirely. Why did he say to sanctify you? Why did he have to say entirely? Because, he goes on to say, and may your spirit, say it with me, and be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Their salvation worked out three different ways. Three different areas of you that have to be saved. Your spirit had to be made alive in Christ. Your soul has to be transformed by the renewing of the mind into the image of Christ-likeness in your character. And your body has to be glorified. So there are three places in each one of us that need salvation as a whole person. Very clear. Talks about it in Hebrews, the fourth chapter as well. Mm -hmm. So your soul realm... Uh, is, well, let's start with your body. Your body is your physiological uh, machine that you live in, right? It's <laughs> animated, and it's guided by the soul and the spirit, but it relates to your environment. You eat food, you smell flowers, you look at the beauty, right? You see, you hear, you hear Maria talking in the back, right? All kinds of things. That, that, you're, that's called your flesh, right? Now we know from Scripture that the flesh is fallen, and in the fallen nature, it reverses these because, because the unredeemed person is spiritually dead. The soul is warped by the flesh, and the flesh is on the throne, and the natural people are guided by whatever feels good. Pleasure, you know, the, 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 whatever carnal thing comes out of you, it's me, myself, and I, is the unholy trinity of the flesh, right? The, the, the basis of interpreting your life is me, myself, and I. What does me good? What's good for me? What feels good? Looks good? Tastes good? What pleasure can I get from the world? That's the flesh. Right? And then there's the soul as the mind, will, and emotions. Those things have to come in alignment, what is called sanctification, the progressive nature of our salvation. The soul has to come in alignment with the Word of God. So that's why Paul says in Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
And that's why Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 1, make every effort to add to your faith, and he talks about character qualities that are not there at your initial salvation. They have to be added as you walk with the Lord. How many know that? Amen? Amen. That's called soul salvation or sanctification. <coughs> and your spirit man, which is the area of your God consciousness, is your intuition, conscious, and communication, and it's the, it's the seat of the soul, and it's your individual personality. Because that's what goes with you when you die. It's, your body is not your personality. That comes out of your spirit. Amen? And when Jesus resurrected from the dead, it says, remember when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again? What was he talking about there? That spirit, the scripture says, was made alive in Jesus Christ. So your spirit, man, is instantly transformed and made right in the eyes of God. Everyone in here is spiritually alive if you are truly in Christ. That means your, your animation and your, the guidance for your life comes through the Holy Spirit where you, your spirit is joined together with the Holy Spirit. How many know that? Amen? Every single person in this room, if you're a believer in Christ, your spirit is in union with the Holy Spirit. And He is your guide. He is your knower. He is your counselor. He reveals all truth inside of you. You cannot be a Christian without the Holy Spirit, as Paul says in Romans, the 8th chapter. So the salvation works out in three tenses. The, the T-I-O-Ns, right? Theological terms, the T-I-O-Ns, but, and they're all used in Scripture by Paul and Peter and John. First of all, here's your salvation in three tenses. Justification. This is the completed aspect of our salvation that primarily affects our spiritual condition. Right? This is where the penalty of sin is removed so your spirit man can be made alive and born again, it's called. Right? Jesus said you must be born again. That, and, and you know Nicodemus was confused because he was thinking without the Holy Ghost in the natural. That what do you mean? Can I enter my mother's womb a second time? And of course that's absurd. Jesus was talking about the spirit man being reborn in Christ by faith through the work of the Holy Ghost. How many know that the Holy Spirit regenerates the fallen, dead spirit? Amen. Amen? It's a miraculous work. You don't see it. You don't taste it. You know, you can't touch it, but you know it happens because there's a change in you. When you're saved, all of a sudden your, your spirit man no longer desires for the things of the flesh, and you start to feel a war in you. If you feel a war of the flesh and the spirit, that means you're saved. If you don't have a war between the flesh and the spirit, you need Jesus. Because the Christian experiences the flesh tugging, and your spirit's like, no, no, no. And there should be an uncomfortableness when you are in sin or when you are in error. Amen? What, so, uh, yes, sir? What's the verse uh, in one of Paul's epistles where he says he, he wants to do what he wants to do? Romans 7. Romans 7. Yes. Yeah. Romans 7 is just like Galatians chapter 5, but expanded on. So, what I want to do, I do not do. And what I do not want to do, I do. What a wretched man I am. Thanks be to the Lord for Jesus Christ who set him free out of that cycle so that you can walk free from the bondage of sin and then therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. On and on and on it goes. But that's the struggle because the flesh man wants to do it contrary to the spirit man. Right? And let me tell you something, when you're in that, I've been there and done that, I'm sure all of you have there. When you're going down like a wall, it's torture. <laughs> I've been there. You can't get peace or anything. You know the Holy Ghost is on you. Uh, one minister called him the hound of heaven. I love that view because it's really true. Sanctification. This is process salvation. Hagamosis, this in the Greek means the process of advancing in holiness. The use of Use of the believer being progressively transformed by the Lord into his likeness or similarity of his nature. This is process salvation that affects issues of the soul. It is an ongoing thing. 
This is where the power of sin is being removed from your life. So the penalty of sin is removed. Nobody here is under the, the penalty of sin if you are in Christ Jesus. But the power of sin is still like in this tug of war and your life should look like this on a graph. You start out as a baby Christian and your character and your Christ-likeness and your moral preferences should be slowly going up, right? Now, this is where grace is important because none of us can live perfectly yet. And there are provisions in the New Covenant, right? For us that even though we sin, John says in his second epistle, there is an advocate who is our propitiation which holds your righteous position even when you sin. Thank goodness for that. Thank, thank goodness that there is a throne of grace that we can approach in our time of need. And by the way, the writer of Hebrews, when he says approaching the grace in our time of need, that this doesn't mean you're having a bad day. That's talking about when you're in the midst of a struggle with sin, you can approach Jesus Christ on his throne and he will help you. He is your advocate, he is your intercessor, and he is your high priest. He will never turn away a saint struggling with sin. There is no besetting sin that God says, oh, you can't come before me. No. When you sin, the first thing you do is you put distance between you and God. I've been there, done that. I'm going to preach to myself right now. So this is very, not come across condemning on anyone. You break fellowship. You stop praying. You stop reading the word. It's the worst thing. Satan's got you when you do that. He's got you in a web. He's like a black widow pulling you in. Do you know that the, 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 the work of the cross is so powerful that Jesus Christ beckons you to come to him in the worst point of sinfulness you, and as a believer or an unbeliever? You could, be, you could be a drunkard, a drug addict, into all kinds of different things, and there's nothing that that blood hasn't paid for that you can come into his presence. That's called, it's called the good news for a reason. Amen? So finally, there's glorification. That's future bodily resurrection and the final removal of the presence of sin. So the, the presence of sin is going to be in your life to the day you die and go into glory and, and then you'll be glorified one day in the future where the fullness of it will be removed and all of its effects permanently. So I think I've given you plenty of evidence to say that salvation is quite a complex undertaking through God's point of view now. It's easy for us to accept Jesus and walk it out, right? But what happened is... I could preach about 25 lessons here to show you each aspect of what really happened at the cross and over time from the foundation of the world. Amen? So use this to say, hey, you know what? There are aspects, you know, when I am justified by faith, that means I have the right as a child of God, as adopted into the family, to utilize the promises and provisions like Peter talks about, right? And then also know that there's a part on your end, on the manward side, you've got to walk this out. It's called co-laboring with Christ. You've got to pick up your cross. You know what, I, you know what I, I, I was praying this morning before coming to church, and I just had like the Holy Spirit, just, and I'm like, what is really, I've been preaching on this for several months now. I want to know, really, how do you view a true saint that is walking it out and pleasing to you. How do you get to the place for sure where at the end of your life when you meet God, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. He said, you know what? He's like, how did you come to me? And I said, through the cross. And he's like, if you're still on your deathbed clinging on to that cross, you've done it right. And I'm like, wow. That's it. Pick up your, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. There's no easy way to do it. It's painful. It's hard. It's struggling against sin 
struggling against your own spiritual immaturity is exhausting sometimes. And now we have seeker-friendly churches that want to take away the offense of the cross and say, don't worry about all that. Jesus loves you. Live however you want. We are in big trouble. <laughs> Stay away from that. If, 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 if you're not being challenged at church, find another church. Because we should be challenging one another as much as we're encouraging one another, as much as we're doing life together and all those good things. Amen? The believer, alive in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit indwells, right? God is at work in you. Here's the positional standpoint. To both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's in your spirit, man. God is at work in you, right? That Holy Ghost working in your spirit as you're yielding to it. And how many know this is why you got to walk by the Spirit? What's walking by the Spirit? Right? What, 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 is, what does the Scripture mean when it says to walk by the Spirit? It means that God is your all consuming fire. You're in the Scripture. You're in prayer. You're talking to God. And, you know, I try to every day get in the Word before I get my day going. Why? Because that helps me to walk by the Spirit. And that fills me with the Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit, but it also says be filled with the Spirit. You've got to fill your vessel because it drains out. Because we're not immortal yet. So you've got to shh, take some in in the morning. Shh, be like Mary and take some in in the afternoon. Yeah. Get out of the Grace Community Encouragement page and get more Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. And come to church. Come to Bible study. Yeah. Meet with one another. Spend time together. The Bible says encourage one another. Bear one, another bear one another's burdens. We've got a lot of burdens right now. This has been a trying time for a lot of people's lives. Amen? In the soul man, your emotions have to be yielded to the Holy Ghost. Emotions are indicators, not directors. You don't ignore your emotions, but you don't let them run wild and direct your life. What does it say about the angry man? Right? The person who is just angry all the time, or the glutton, or this, that their emotions are running their life. Amen. Not to be that way for the Christian. You know, now we've all been there, and we're all a work in progress. Give grace to yourself, because I know there are times when I'm on the road, and the guy gives me the finger, <laughs> my flesh wants to return in kind. <laughs> because. I'm only doing five over, and he wants to do 25 over, right? So then you get to the body, it says, work out your, your salvation with fear and trembling. That is actually part of the first verse on the top. It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who has work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. See, a little bit of him, a little bit of you, but it starts with him. If you get that right, you've got New Testament spirituality. If you say, I have to do, 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 do to get his approval, you're off course. If you say, I'm just going to sit there and let Jesus do everything for me, you're on the other side of the ditch and you're off course. A little bit of him, a lot of him, a little bit of you. Amen? So bridging the gap between eternity and earth, the last hurdle God has to overcome is our time difference. So that is why the New Testament is broken down into positional truths and experiential truths. Positional truths are things that God has accomplished on our behalf that we cannot. You are seated in heavenly places in Christ. That is a positional truth, right? God did that. You can't do that. But then there are experiential truths. Walk by the Spirit. Love one another. Self-control. Right? Flee from all those sinful things. That's 
your man work side responsibilities that you co-labor through with the Holy Spirit. And if you look at New Testament scripture, it's all divided along these lines. There are some verses talking about what God has done and our heavenly position and the promises that he's given us. And then there are scriptures that are talking about are the commands and first person commands and responsibilities on the man word side. Both are together and they can't be ignored. Nor can you put one over the other. Position flows into experience. It's top-down spirituality in the New Covenant. And I'm going to show you some examples from that when we're going to get, uh, get be getting into the book of Ephesians where uh, I'll pick this up. Uh, we got a special guest speaker next week. I need everybody here for this. This is going to be amazing. And then I'm going to pick up and we're going to actually go through Ephesians chapter 1 based on uh, this teaching today. And I'm going to show you examples of all this stuff just in one letter. Amen? Any questions or comments? Interesting. Yes, sir. Bring up business about position and experience. That verse you read in 1 Thessalonians, mm -hmm. uh, you go take that, go back to Ephesians 1-4, where God talks about, where Paul talks about that God has, in Christ, made us holy and blameless mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. Okay? But that verse in 1 Thessalonians 5 is experience. That we would be blameless until the day of Christ. We must walk so that we can remain blameless what our position is, that's what God desires for our experience mm -hmm. until Christ comes. And boy, what a way to put that together. Yeah. It, it really is. And this is, again, this is what the Bible calls spiritual understanding. That's really important. And I think it's neglected over the, I would say, the, the, the theological time that we're in and what you, the, the, the churches are preaching right now. And we've really gone to this entertainment program mindset. And we need to be getting back to the core aspects of the gospel. Let me just close with this scripture. Uh, if you want to go with me to the book of Colossians. I think this is a great way to end today. Colossians, the first chapter. Paul is encouraging them that they're starting to grow spiritually and he has sent Epaphras, who's given this good report that the church in Colossus is growing and Paul's in prison at this point and he's sending his itinerant ministers out because he cares so much about the churches and Paul always had his thumb on the condition of each church. How many know that each church has their own unique challenges where we're in right now? So like if, say, I went down the road to Community Baptist, they have their, their own things going on there, and God's dealing with that. But in this congregation, this local body, God's dealing with things here. And Paul always had his finger on all the churches. He knew everything that was going on, and he had quite a ministry team that would go out and, and, of pastors and teachers that would minister uh, and bring in the reports. So he hears this. Now, Paul is in prison. And he's about to say something that is the, of all the things he could say, the important of the importance of the importance, this is what he thought the church needed. And he repeats this in the other prison epistles in Philippians and, and Ephesus, and the book of Ephesians that we're going to be looking at. And in verse 9, he says, For this reason also, since the day we have heard of it, the good report of them, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, 
for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. What a powerful way to look at church growth. Growing in spiritual understanding, growing in knowledge and wisdom. And, and look what he says there. It's a, there's cause and effect. Growing in wisdom and knowledge and spiritual understanding is the causative agent for walking the worthy life. If you're not growing in the Word of God and feeding on it in your life, you're never going to live the worthy life that you are called to. Because we are called to share in the inheritance. And look what it, 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 it causes, it causes something to be strengthened with all power. Do you want to feel God's power in your life? Yes. Do, you want to, do you want to be able to tap into His strength yes. and endure through the challenges you're in right now? Yes. Get acquainted with spiritual understanding and wisdom and knowledge. And then the attaining. What do you attain? Steadfastness. Patience and joy. How many could use some steadfastness? How many could use patience and enduring of challenges right now? How many could use joy and thankfulness of the Lord in your life right now? Even more. Amen. That's my prayer for this church. Every time I get up here, I pray that. Almost every time before I come. Lord, I just say, please, let, let your flocks hear your word. Let them grow in knowledge and wisdom and spiritual understanding because the ultimate goal is that you may walk worthy, that you may attain that calling and walk in it and not spend your life waffling back and forth and never growing, never producing, never being fruitful, never experiencing God's power in your life. Amen? Yeah. Will you pray with me? Lord, I'm just so grateful for each and every person here today. I'm so grateful for all that you've done for us. Lord, we stand upon your word this morning. I ask, Lord, as Paul prayed for the church, that this would be a prayer over our church. And I pray personally, Lord, that they would all grow in spiritual understanding and in wisdom and in the knowledge of you. Lord, that we all here may walk the worthy walk and that we all would obtain steadfastness and patience and joy and, and most of all experience in that strengthening power in our lives in the daily. Help us to focus on you, Jesus. Help us to completely make you the Lord of our life, to love you each and every day, and to walk with you every hour. Father, I pray an extra special blessing today that all of us would just be even more aware of your presence in our lives, that you would draw close as we draw close to you as you have promised, and that each person in their personal lives and in their challenges would receive your strength today, and receive that provision of your power, that this isn't just talk, as Paul says, but power to attain all things you have called us to. Lord, I, I just pray over us faithfulness, that each one of us would be faithful. And give us your strength. Help us to know you even more, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you all.